everybody and thank you for uh, returning. The meeting is being recorded and um, we welcome Darby back for part two. Yesterday's focus on vocation and a lot of activity over the um, course of the workshop and then thank you to the note takers that sent me your group notes throughout the afternoon and into the evening. We'll collate all those with today's activities for um, distribution to the group. So today we turn our attention to community engaged learning, sort of the part two of our two-pronged uh, reimagining of the liberal education program. Darby, please take it away. Thank you, Peter, and thanks everybody for, for coming back today. It's great to see you again. Uh, I'm gonna jump right into it. Um, just so you'll know, our format will be very similar to yesterday. I'm gonna make a sort of slide-based formal presentation about community-engaged learning. Um, and then we're going to go into breakout rooms to have some discussion. Those will be randomized again. You'll probably be with different people, um, but you'll have a chance to process my presentation um, in a small community of colleagues. And then uh, we'll come back together into the large room. I will give you sort of an assignment for individual work. You'll have time for individual work to actually get make some progress and we'll come back together again. And um, use Padlet again to sort of share some of uh, our thoughts or our intentions, and then we'll have some, some open Q&A. Uh, we'll also have a little open q and I hope, after the breakout room discussion. So that's our plan. And um, if you have a better idea, feel free to send it to me in the chat and I will <laughs> consider adjusting, but maybe not, a little late. Um, I should have asked her that at the end of la yesterday to say, if you want something to be different tomorrow, tell me, but too late. Anyway, I can make little changes. So I'm going to share my screen and um, get going here. Let's see here. Uh, okay, let me move that baby down and go here. And um, once again, um, as we did yesterday, um, I will share with you um, when it comes time to for our individual um, work, your kind of workshop work, I'll share with you um, all the slides that I think might you might be interested in seeing during that time or in a future time. So I'll send you a link to those. So today our focus is community engaged learning. Again, in January, I did present on this in a little more comprehensive of a fashion than I'll be doing today. Um, some of it will sound familiar to some of you. Hope that's okay refresh your, your memory. Um, so I think the first thing um, to note is that while community engaged learning or CEL, so you'll hear me say CEL a lot today, that's community engaged learning. So while community engaged learning or CEL doesn't need to be connected to vocation, it certainly can stand on, on its own, but it can also be understood as an ideal way for students to grapple with this idea of the world's deep hunger. Um, so thinking about Beekner's iconic definition of vocation, um, this is the place where CEL can really um, come in handy when we're trying to bring vocation and CEL together. Um, what happens in the space of authentic community engagement is that students have a chance to develop habits of attunement to and participation in the wider world. So when considered within a vocation frame of reference, community engaged learning serves as an important corrective to assumptions that flourishing or well-being is a personal or individual thing, right? So it would be easy to think about vocation and just get focused there and make it a pretty, pretty individualized experience for students. And that is not what we want. And so one of the great things about having a dual focus on vocation and community engaged learning is that you can use community engaged learning as that kind of corrective um, on campus and in the, in the culture of how you talk about vocation because you've also got these opportunities to think about, immerse oneself in and be schooled by the, the wider world. Community engaged learning moves us beyond a model of student development that culminates in habits of self-reflection, self-exploration, and self-actualization. Those are important habits, but we cannot stop there. CEL problematizes and contests the tendency that we have, at least in our Western culture of, of our age, to 
to um, sort of focus on the heroic or privatized or, or be anything you want, find your passion self. Um, CEL encourages us to pursue common goods and to be inspired by a vision of life abundant for all. So that's um, why CEL makes sense and why it actually is important to have in conversation with vocation. So what is community engagement? Um, lots of different ways of defining it. I'll give you a definition in a minute, but I want to start by emphasizing, and you heard me say this um, in January as well, that by community engagement, I do not mean acts of charity, philanthropy, or even community service. And I know those of you who traffic at Colby Sawyer in community engaged learning, I know you already know this, so I'm speaking for all of us, uh, but it's good to be reminded, all of us, all the time, this is not a call for the privileged to serve the less fortunate, to fix the problems of other communities, or to save the day. Uh, rather than a unilateral flow of goodness and goods and good intentions, with its implied bifurcation of giver and receiver, servant and served, patron and client, the language of engagement attempts to signal a space of shared labor and reciprocal partnership. It aims for an assets-based or a strength-based approach to the other, in which their ideas, history, webs of relationship, and cultural wealth are recognized and valued, and in which any actions or projects that are undertaken are co-created. So this is why we don't use the language of community, um, wait, what's it called, of service learning. <laughs> I, I never say it anymore. Um, it's fine. We understand what people mean by service learning, but let's be as precise with our language as possible. And let's just talk about community engaged learning because it, it, it um, implies a really important paradigm shift in our thinking and our behaving. Community engagement means engaging in community building, community justice work in ways that explicitly privilege the voices and choices of the community whose well being is on the line. <laughs> It means following the lead and learning alongside those on the ground. It means apprenticing ourselves to people from marginalized communities who themselves are leading the change. Every once in a while, you'll have a higher ed faculty member who is that person, uh, but not usually. And so we need to recognize that actually our role here in an important way is to follow the lead of others. In engagement-rooted work, the community is not only a place where we apply learning, it's also a site of learning, a place beyond the classroom where we are nevertheless schooled and skilled up and where we learn that wisdom and expertise are not limited to the walls of academe or owned by those with advanced degrees. As students move into an engagement paradigm where their job is not to serve others or heroically solve problems, but to share space and time and labor and heart with those whose lives and well being are most at stake, they learn very different things from community engagement than they did from community service. Um, now that you've experienced Padlet, I'll just say that um, a fun way, especially if you're doing some remote work with students and you're doing community engaged learning. Um, a, a great thing to do on the first day of talking about what your project is or that there will be a project, just the very first sort of reflection exercise. Um, you know, if, you're, if you've got your whiteboard or chalkboard, you can do this, but you can also do it with Padlet. It's just ask, quite, just put the two words up there, service, community service, community engagement. And, and tell students, um, you know, what do you think the difference is? What are, what are, what are the differences here? Um, and just let them go and they'll, they'll come up with the right answers. They'll start, they'll, they'll think about it and they'll be like, oh yeah. And so that's a great exercise and they do it themselves and you don't have to be any kind of expert. You just lift up what seems like their wisdom. Um, interestingly, the, the things that students learn from community engagement um, often are differentiated depending on their own social location and life experience. So among the things that students from more privileged backgrounds often report when they participate in sustained community engagement are feelings of discomfort, disorientation, guilt, and helplessness. These are obviously not easy emotions to contend with, 
So opportunities for self-reflection are essential, but neither do we want to cater to white fragility, right? Um, and that's often what we see there. Still, um, because engagement is not a one and done moment, but a sustained being with, these students can eventually move into other emotional spaces. Um, they can learn, they can develop moral outrage and eventually kind of stubborn commitment and eventually we hope deep solidarity across differences. Deep solidarity, especially for white people, um, which includes abdicating um, some, some power. Um, for these young people, the, and here I'm talking about our more privileged students, our relatively privileged students, recognizing that these are continua. Um, community engagement prompts a series of moral reckonings that are not a lot of fun. For example, the realization that the world we know has been built by and for white people, or how long lasting and destructive adverse child ex childhood experiences can be. These are hard reckonings, but um, college students are not shying away from them. And in fact, they are seeking them out because I think they're hungry for authenticity and growth. Um, the, the learnings, the differentiated learnings around CEL are not just, um, uh, they, they don't only happen for students from, from relative privilege. Uh, research indicates that college students who tend to be underrepresented in higher education, uh, black, indigenous, people of color, and first generation to college students may especially benefit from high quality community engagement. For these students, community work can be a confidence boost and a source of affirmation and solace. Often, these are students who struggle to feel at home in educational environments that were not designed with them in mind. Getting off campus and into communities that are less contrived and privileged can be a welcome relief. Often, the schools and neighborhoods where community-engaged work finds a focus are similar in some respects to their own schools and neighborhoods. So precisely where their more privileged peers may feel out of sorts or unsure of themselves, minoritized students may feel right at home. Again, that's a broad generalization, but um, rooted in, in evidence. They have knowledge and skills and life experiences of direct relevance to the people with whom they are engaging. Indeed, as young people who have made it to college, they are role models, they are success stories. So on campus, their educational or social background may be somewhat of a liability, but off campus, it's a point of powerful connection and sought after insight. So what is community engaged learning? Um, a basic thing to start with is, the, is where it happens. It happens at the intersection of student learning and community benefit or well-being. So it's, it's right in the crosshairs there. And both those things have to, have to be in place. You'll hear me say this a lot of times today, to have both the student learning and the community benefit. And the way we think about it, um, where I am at Bates, is we think about, okay, the faculty member is sort of the real expert on student learning. Um, and so we count on our faculty member to be really safeguarding the processes and the methods that need to be in place for student learning to take place. Um, the community gets to decide or affirm what it thinks will benefit it. Uh, it gets to decide what well-being is for it. And so um, that means, um, you know, when we have a great idea or we want to try something, you know, we got to have a partner who says, actually, I would love for you to try that and let me be your partner. Um, so we don't get to just say, oh, we think the community would benefit or wouldn't this be great how this would contribute to the community. Yeah, well, you got to have a partner who agrees with you on that one. Um, and then a uh, definition, community engaged learning is a pedagogy, a, a way of teaching, a form of teaching designed to deepen student mastery of course content or disciplinary content or a knowledge base, enhance student investment in their own learning, develop their buy-in, get them more committed to participating in their own learning and develop student skills, a range of skills, all while attempting to address community identified needs in explicit collaboration with community. So there's our definition. 
Um, one thing that I addressed in January that I'm not going to be able to do today just because of time is all the evidence for community engaged learning as a high impact practice. That language, high impact practice, is from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Um, and based on a lot of research that they've done, they've identified a number of evidence based high impact practices, and community engaged learning is one of those. Um, and so I guess I just want to say, trust me that, or go look yourself at the evidence, that there is a lot of evidence that CEL, community engaged learning, motivates students to invest in their own learning and to do better work than when there is no real world outcome at stake. Not in every case, but in most cases. That it helps them master course content, that it expands their understanding of both self and world, and that it gives them a chance to develop skills and capacities that are relevant to college existence and life beyond college. That's, that's pretty clear from the research over the last 20 to 30 years. Research also shows positive correlations of community engaged learning and student retention, um, positive correlations with CEL and students' pursuit of higher levels of education, and also increased positive outcomes for first-gen students and students of color particularly around self-efficacy, academic performance, and persistence to graduation. So there are a ton of reasons to embrace CEL as a pedagogy and as an institutional priority. So thinking um, about what, what CEL can look like and what a model looks like, there are a lot of different ways of thinking about community-engaged learning. Um, at Bates, we've adopted a pretty capacious model basically a, a big tent approach that foregrounds two main values. And I mentioned them already, here we go again. Um, student learning and community defined or community affirmed benefit. Um, we have developed what we call this continuum approach um, because we have a healthy respect for faculty autonomy. <laughs> and um, so we wanna suggest that community engaged learning can take up as little or as much space in a course as a faculty member wants. As long as these two priorities are in fact prioritized, there's, there's so much room to, to do what makes sense in your own course with your own teaching. We've identified three different community engaged learning thresholds. Um, and um, these sort of correlate with sort of how much space in a class the CEL component takes up how much room it needs. So first is low threshold. Um, and this is where the way we think about it is this is when the CEL is akin to a single assignment in a class. And I'm gonna give some examples in a minute. Um, but you know, it's just instead of doing, you know, taking X exam or doing a certain kind of um, project or whatever, they do CEL, your students do CEL. So it takes the place of a single assignment in a course. Um, middle or medium threshold is where the community engaged learning functions kind of like a course text. Something that is assigned is in maybe pretty constant conversation with other texts, with other you know, primary documents um, and sources of, of information. Um, it's, a, it's an interlocutor throughout the course. Um, and I'll give examples of this in a minute. And then finally, high threshold. Uh, which is where the community engaged learning is an organizing principle of the course, um, a, a key focus, a, a primary driver. Um, and then um, what all of these have in common, and the kind of point of shared concern here is these two shared values. Um, so if you think about this continuum approach um, and you think about what I said yesterday about vocation when I try to make the distinction between a saturation model of vocation and an infusion model of vocation, where sometimes in your advising practice or your teaching practice, um, there, are, there may be some of you that really wanna saturate a course with vocation, um, but um, you could also just do a small infusion. And here in community engaged learning, a similar kind of approach, which is there's no judgment um, about which one is better. It's, it's what makes sense. It's what makes sense 
for the person who's going to be leading that work, the staff member, the faculty member. Um, and that's really, really important to um, have us all have as much autonomy as we can, we can have, because I think that's when we do our best work. So um, best practices. Uh, just as there are best practices for traditional classroom teaching and for online teaching, there are best practices for community engaged teaching. Um, and I'm going to lift up some um, folks at your institution may phrase them differently or have more to add, but these are the ones that <clears throat> I definitely um, don't want to miss talking about. Um, whoops, wrong way. Hold on. Nah, 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 nah. Okay, here we go. Yes, okay. First, uh, community engaged learning needs to be treated as a pedagogy. <laughs> It's an approach to teaching that demands the same kind of thoughtfulness, rigor, and creativity as any other approach. That's really important. Um, next, and also, just to go back, um, this is why the institution has to see, uh, or, or let me just say that, let me claim that, the institution needs to treat community-engaged learning as a pedagogy. It is not service. <laughs> community-engaged teaching does not belong in the service bucket of faculty evaluation. Um, it, it, you, you may do some things with community that belong there, but community-engaged learning is about teaching, and that's where it belongs. And community-engaged research is about scholarship and um, scholarly product productivity, and that's where it belongs. Today, we're focusing on the learning and the teaching, and that's where it belongs. And if your faculty evaluation process doesn't allow for that, then we need to talk. We're still working on this at Bates to get it all the way right. So it's, it's not an easy nut to crack, but it's an important one. Um, next, in terms of CEL best practices, the, the CEL needs to be integrated into the logic and flow of the course. Um, the CEL component or dimension of the course um, needs to, students need to understand how it relates to course goals, to learning outcomes, to course content, to grading policy, to everything. They should not experience CEL as an add-on, as some kind of feel-good thing, or as something you're just doing because the college has told you to. It's got to be integrated in. They need to experience it as fully integrated into the course. And that starts with the syllabus. Um, it starts with the course description, the list of assignments, the grading scheme. You've got to value CEL as you would any other important part of your course. Um, next. Best practice is to treat the community as a valued co-educator. The community is not a laboratory. It's not a backdrop for student learning. It's a valued partner in the education of our students. And you, as, as teachers, we model that in the fact that we, we bring our community partners into our classroom. We Zoom them in, or we show pictures, and we go to their website, or um, you know, we at least talk about our community partners with respect and excitement as our co-educators. Um, that's important to model for students. And then a final best practice that I'll mention today is that, as always, in community-engaged learning, um, we need to focus on the learning. So um, what does a focus on the learning look like? Um, I, I think of CEL as involving a kind of recursive interplay of five components. And again, other people will parse this differently and that's fine. Uh, but these are five things that, that as an instructor, you'll want to build into your course. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert in each area, but rather that you plan to and you will invite students into these five areas of consideration. So first, learning about the community, the community identified need that the CEL work will attempt to address and considering ethical forms of engagement with community. Now you might say, oh my gosh, but I'm not an anthropologist or I don't know the community that well. So this is again, not asking for you to be you, the faculty member, to be the expert and to deliver this. Um, it's as simple as, as an early assignment before anybody does anything, you say, okay, here's the, here's the community, here's the partner on um, your first assignment um, is to um, learn everything you can about. And when you come into class, um, I'm gonna ask you know, each one of you to jot something down on the board that you learned about that community. Um, and they'll teach each other, right? Um, the partner and you will have figured out what is, the, what is the need that this work is gonna attempt to address. 
um, or to participate collaboratively in working on. And then in terms of ethical forms of engagement with community, there are um, some really short, sweet essays. Um, I've got a one page essay <laughs> that I use all the time. It's actually written by a Bates alum um, who's an anthropologist. I'll be happy to, to share it with you, but it's, it's pretty good. But there also, you can use poetry. Gwendolyn Brooks has some great stuff. And there are a lot of different ways to, to do this. But, and again, you can ask your students to think about what would ethical forms of engagement with community look like as opposed to unethical. And they'll, and they'll do the work. Um, second, another um, of the sort of five recursive components of, of CEL learning is learning about the self. Students need to be learning not just about the community, but also be thinking about themselves. And that includes interrogating their own positionality vis-a-vis -vis the community and their own, how they think they might be perceived by the community and why, um, what impact they hope to have on the community, what impact they think they are having on the community. That's work that needs to be going on. Again, this can be happening in occasional journal exercises or, or pair shares in your class, lots of different ways, but this needs to be recursively present, returning to explorations and interrogations of self. Um, next is actually doing the work uh, that, that, uh, that you've decided is gonna be the project. So um, part of the learning, a ton of learning happens just by kind of throwing yourself in and say, okay, I'm trying this. And they're gonna be learning so many things about themselves, about the real world, about how things work. And some of the learnings are so basic, but so important. Like they'll learn that um, if you reach out to your community partner at midnight, and are thinking that they're gonna to reply to you between midnight and 3 a.m. because that's when all your friends reply to you, that's not gonna happen. And you're, you know, you're gonna to have to give community partners a little more time to get back to you. Um, they'll learn that you know, if you address an email to a community partner as, hey, blah, 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 that you know, the community partner might get back to you with a dear Ms. Smith to try to school you <laughs> and, and how to uh, communicate. Um, in a respectful and professional way. So doing the work, they'll learn a lot about that and you just offer times for them to just process. What are you learning out there as you're doing this work? Next um, is the reflection on the experience. So this goes part and parcel with the previous one. And again, these are the kinds of questions you can ask in classroom conversation or for writing or for group chats or um, for blog posts, whatever it is, however you wanna Use it. And then finally, um, reflection on how the experience amplifies, illustrates, calls into question, or otherwise relates to other course materials and topics. So this has got to be constantly happening where the CEL is an interlocutor with the rest of the course and the course materials, right? Um, so a lot of times I'll say, if there's a, a paper or something, I'll say that, you know, I'll say, you know, you've got to have a minimum of six sources, one of which must be the text of your CEL experience, which you've got to treat as seriously as any of the other texts. Um, and I'll tell them that at the beginning of the semester um, when, when I'm in that middle medium threshold um, space for CEO. Um, so I wanna quickly just click over to show you, um, ah, there it went. Um, but this is uh, just the webpage at, at my little center at Bates and um, we've got, you know, some um, resources here that we've just culled from our own experience and other places as well. And some of this, um, you know, it's, it's pretty simple. Other places have way more built out um, resources than we do, but um, feel free to take a look at ours anytime you want. Um, okay. And then, oh, let's see. What did I do here? Uh, let's see, I think I just have to click through this real quickly. Ba, 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 ba. Here we go. Okay, now a few more tips just from the trenches. I wouldn't call these best practice, but these are uh, Darby's tips for um, not only surviving, but thriving with community engaged learning. Um, one, and <laughs> this is the mantra, anybody who knows me at Bates will know, I just say it all the time. You gotta start small and get it right. Um, you want to do that for your own reputation as a teacher, for your own standards of excellence as a scholar, 
um, especially if you're pre-tenure or anything like that, um, you know, you, you want to get things right. You want to get it right for your students. You want to get it right for the community. So start small. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Um, take, take something that, that seems reasonable um, and be in conversation with people. Does this make sense to you? So when I have a faculty member who comes in with like crazy ambitious ideas, I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to build toward that with you. What's, how could we start? Let's, this first semester when you try it, let's, let's just start. And what would that look like? Um, so I think that's really important. Um, another one, kind of unrelated to that one, is, is thinking about your students. Um, get your CEL meta narrative in your head. And what, by that I mean, why are you doing this? Why are you, as the person who's, who's sort of leading this learning experience, facilitating the learning experience for these students, why CEL? Like you, you have to know that, you have to have that in your head and you have to, you have to remind students, especially if it's um, uh, a project that is happening, uh, you know, periodically over the course of the semester. But even if it's something that's happening toward the end, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, you want to, you want to forecast it. So in week three, you want to be saying, so just a reminder, um, you know, I mentioned this on the first day and you see it in the syllabus, but, but, you know, nine weeks from now, here's what we're going to be doing. And what we're gonna start talking about now and for the next few weeks is gonna lay the foundation for you being able to do that well. And there are some eighth grade kids who are gonna depend on you to do that well. So that's one of the reasons I want you to be invested um, in what we're, what we're gonna start on today in this course. So just ways of just reminding them of what's coming, reminding them that it's important. Um, that's important because I've seen too many times where CEL is this, is treated by the faculty unintentionally, but it comes across to the students as an add-on. Um, next tip is get ready to roll with it. Um, unpredictability happens. Uh, the one thing you can predict in CEL is that something is gonna catch you off guard. Um, and if you have high need for control, which I actually do, this, there's a little bit of therapy going on here for you, um, but it's great. Um, basically, you know, um, the next uh, piece of advice here um, connects to that, which is look for the teachable moments. When things fall apart, when things fail, when the, when the partner stops replying to your students suddenly, um, you know, make it a teachable moment for your students. Say, okay, you know what, let's Let's, why don't you share with me all the ways you've done your outreach? Oh, okay, yeah, so I'm looking at this email and I'm thinking, I don't know, you know, the subject line makes it look like it could be anything. Um, how about thinking, you know, more carefully about your subject line or whatever, right? So make everything a teachable moment, help students reflect, encourage them to reflect. So now a few um, examples. And again, you have some great examples of CEL here at Colby Sawyer. And all you're really trying to do is just build on those. Um, so I'm gonna be fairly quick here. Um, what I mostly wanna do want you to see is that there are ways of doing community engaged learning that have integrity and that don't take up too much space in a course. I'm saying this because of the start small and get it right um, mantra. So um, first of all, uh, an example of a low threshold CEL course. So this is a course, science communication course and kind of intro level course in our biology department where the CEL um, functions or, or is basically a single assignment in the course. In this course, um, students um, work in small groups and they dig into a science topic that's aligned with the middle school curriculum, um, including consultation with a teacher. Um, so they, they meet with the teacher um, and they talk about, you know, what are the students learning in science and um, you know, that teacher can, can zoom in or the students can go see, see her or him or them. Um, but a little bit of consultation so that there's some, you know, that, that, that what the students are doing is actually responding to a community identified interest or need. Um, then in those small groups, they dig in, they learn about something, then they develop an interactive presentation for a middle school audience. Um, we all know that the way to learn something is to have to teach it to another. And if you have to um, transfer the knowledge from sort of one frame of reference to another, one audience to another, it forces a level of mastery that you don't have to have if you're just talking to your peers, right? 
Um, so they have to develop an interactive presentation. And, and that means something that the students have to, uh, the K-12 kids have to really be able to latch onto. So it's not just talking to them and being animated with it. And then you have to actually present it. Um, and so some examples uh, of topics, um, are, are, these are some of the examples that, that students have chosen um, in conversation with the middle school teacher to present on. Um, their uh, preparation uh, for, the, for the Bates students involved things like researching the topic, <laughs> thinking about narrative structure um, and, and rhetorical um, complexity and strategies. Um, they also get a guest workshop um, by a faculty member from our theater department on public speaking. Um, and um, often this um, project also includes, and so they have to do a little bit of preparing for um, what we call a college aspirations moment. So just a chance for, um, you know, the middle school students to ask questions of the college students, to maybe have 10 minutes of small group talk where you've got 10 middle schoolers and one or two college students and, and just having some Q&A. Um, one of the things that if you talk to K-12 teachers, one of the main reasons that they want their kids to engage with college kids is just to work away on that idea of developing a college going culture, one where our kids can imagine going to college. And part of that is seeing college kids. You know, oh yeah, I was with a college kid today. Helps people imagine that they too could be a college kid. Um, these are some of the rules. You can just glance through that. I'm not going to read through it. Um, but these were what the faculty member identified um, as um, some of the directives for, for his students. And then I know um, some of you have asked about assessment. And so I'm going to give you a real simple example here. Um, but at the end of the presentation, uh, when the course was taught this time, um, the uh, middle school students were asked to fill out a uh, short little um, card, a little, um, what do you call those, like index cards, and um, you can see, um, you know, what the questions were, but just see, see what they wrote, you know. Um, I liked how it was interactive and had a lot of props, but it also says, you know, what, what's a question? So, so there's, what you're seeing here is a little bit of assessment on the format of this project and on the content, on what it actually delivered. So this is a great question. What about nasal vaccines, right? Um, does it use the same method? Um, here's another kid's um, response. So, you can, th this is evidence, this is evidence that, um, uh, of, of how it went, right? Um, so this is a kind of assessment. Uh, moving on, our bio department is just all about community-engaged learning. I have no idea why, but they're just into it. Another course, Biology of Cooperation, I just wanted to show you these visuals. So this is a course where the middle school comes to Bates, comes to us. The one before was one where we go there. Um, and so they come here and they have sort of a short poster presentation by a small group of students where they're again trying to just teach something about cooperation. So top right hand corner you can see bat jeopardy. So the students taught them about cooperation among bats and then they played jeopardy. They played bat jeopardy. Um, on the left hand on the bottom you can see I think that was like um, Savannah um, shoots and ladders. They had learned about the savanna and biological cooperation on the savanna. So um, just some just some um, visuals there. In terms of middle threshold, very different kind of course, a course called Music in the Brain. This is where um, students learn about the musical vocabulary of the 18th century and about the cognitive practices that help explain why some of those musical conventions are still used in diverse musical genres today. Um, and so each student had to create a composition using um, 18th century practices. And, and that was what they would have done in any class, whether it was CEL or not. The CEL part was that students worked together to create a, an Is It Mozart game show that they played with local senior citizens. Um, players would listen to two compositions back to back and try to guess which one was Mozart. So here's an example of a student composition and, that would have gone right next to a little clip of actual Mozart. Let's see if I can get this to play. So 
so um, you can imagine, ah, hold on, I'm trying to get, uh, 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 go back. I wanna get out. Oh, great, I have to sign in. Hold on, you guys. Ha, ha, ha. There we go. Do you guys have, um, do you have dual factor authentication at um, Colby Sawyer? Anybody out there? Yes. You know what that is? So it has to like call my cell phone or whatever, and then it'll let me back in. Um, it's sort of a pain. Okay, here we go. But that was still cool, that music thing, wasn't that? Just love it. Um, okay, here we go again. Apologies for that little, okay. Um, and then finally, a high threshold example. This is a course that is gonna be happening, actually this is several courses. Because of COVID, um, we're not allowing community engaged learning in person this semester at Bates. So our faculty have had to work with us to find all kinds of remote opportunities. So um, students from several education courses are gonna contribute to this project this year. It's basically one faculty member and she's gonna have um, students from lots of different classes work on this of her classes, but they're gonna be interviewing young adult leaders from our local immigrant community. And based on the interviews, they're gonna write short biographies geared toward um, ELL students in local schools. They're gonna create a website or a book modeled after these books by Vashti Harrison, Harrison and they're gonna develop um, lessons that will accompany each featured biography that will be, again, um, geared toward certain level of ELL students. And their community partner in this case is gonna be the Lewiston Public Schools ELL program. Um, so another good example, but this is where it's high threshold because the, the whole course is gonna be um, circulating around this project. So um, I am gonna keep just plowing through here um, because Peter mentioned last night that um, y'all had some questions about how do you assess this kind of stuff. I'm gonna show you what we do with CEL and happy to have a conversation about vocation, but I think it's gonna be similar. Um, so uh, it's a good question. And as always, <laughs> you start with clear student learning outcomes and then ask, how could I measure those? Um, and then, you know, the ways you can measure, we tend to focus at Bates, I always think about, well, what do students have to say about whether they are um, learning the stuff that I want them to learn? And then uh, based on the evidence that they provide, what is my estimation of their progress or their achievement toward those goals? And then in CEL, you also have, uh, what feedback can I glean from the partner that might help me know um, whether these goals are being achieved? So um, here's, here are some examples. This is a huge long list and you can just pick and choose, take a few out as, as I'm speaking. But these are examples of student learning outcomes for CEL. Um, and they're not for any particular course. They're just kind of, I just pulled them out from student learning outcome lists from CEL courses. Um, but these would be, you know, examples. Um, and then, um, Here's a specific example, what it looks like in an actual course. So this is history uh, 281, US immigration history. And you can see how the, the CEL learning outcome fits within the overall learning objectives for the course. Um, here are the CEL experience of students, which in this course involved volunteering for an hour or two each week with a local immigrant serving organization. Um, and that, oops, um, that, uh, contributed to most of these learning outcomes, but it's targeted ex explicitly in the last goal. Um, so the first, um, and then here, here's another one, sorry, one more, learning objectives for a religious studies class, not mine, but a colleague's, death in the afterlife. And you can see, you, you could guess that her CEL project involved um, sharing research with community partners about death and afterlife practices in Asian religious traditions. And another time I can tell you how that share out happened and that kind of thing, but there's another example. Um, so you can also, um, wait, what was I gonna do? Okay, so basically you get your student learning outcomes and then you say, how would we know if these are happening, right? And so one way you know that is from students' own self-assessments. 
and um, you can create your own at Bates. We have a centralized tool through Qualtrics um, where my office actually sends out surveys at the end of every semester to every student in a CEL course and we're asking standardized questions. This is just a screenshot of um, one set of questions where students can um, give me a sense and their faculty member a sense of whether their CEL experience um, had any impact on um, things that we tend to think of as CEL outcomes. Here's another screenshot. This is just part of the list. Um, but again, did, did, did your CEL experience give you the chance to develop any of these skills or capacities? So we get some, some kind of quantitative stuff and we have some qualitative open-ended questions and we get a feel for students. And when you've got three or 400 students filling these things out, um, you, you can see the patterns and, um, and you've, got some, you've got some good evidence institutionally as well as um, by course. Um, we do not share the results of these with anybody except the faculty member, not their chair, not the dean of faculty. I'm the only person who sees them and the faculty member because we only ever want the evidence to help the faculty member because if you're, if you're doing CEL, we love you and you can use this in any way you want to, but we're not going to share it with anybody. Um, also, last thing, um, faculty members, obviously, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to assess this work from our vantage point and rubrics are a good idea a good way to do that. So here's an example. It's sort of cut off at the bottom because again, it was just a uh, sort of a screenshot at the last minute this morning when I knew there was some interest in assessment. Should have figured that. Um, but anyway, um, these are, um, you know, some ways of, of thinking about that and, and being able to assess student work and be able to report, okay, you know what, I, through this project, I, you know, students really are developing these learning outcomes and 80% of them are actually approach, approaching proficiency, whatever. Um, partner feedback, I don't have time to give examples of. Um, this has been uh, less useful for the individual faculty to get the partner feedback and more useful for my office to get and then to interpret, go back to the partner and figure things out and then be able to share with the faculty member um, how we think it went. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. That was a lot. I realize I went a little fast. Thank you for hanging with me. We are now going to um, get into um, Zoom breakout rooms. We're going to stay there until 2.15. So you have about 23, 24 minutes. And you have three jobs in your breakout rooms. One, introduce yourselves to each other if you don't know each other. And even if you think you do, but you're not so sure, like do it anyway in case somebody's forgotten somebody's name. Second, choose a note taker and eventually send some notes to Peter um, if you're willing. <laughs> and then finally, I'm gonna put into the chat um, what I want you to focus on, but it's the same as yesterday. What resonates with you about CEL as a teaching practice? What concerns do you have? And is anything sparking for you when you think about integrating at some level CEL into your teaching practice sometime in, say, the next two years, right? Is something sparking? Do you have an idea? Did something come alive for you? So um, I'll ask Dan to pop you into those groups, and I will put those questions in the chat in just a minute. Thank you. See you soon. Um, so are we mostly back now, Dan? Yep, everybody's back. Okay, all right. So uh, let's see. Jen, do you want to do that now? Jen White, I would love to have introduce um, the new Community Engaged Learning Coordinator for Colby Sawyer College. This is super exciting. This is a sign of real institutional investment and uh, maturation, I guess, on this issue. So I'm very excited to, um, yeah, to hand the mic over to Jen for a minute. Yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to, I don't want to take up much time at all. I just want you to all welcome Risa Hall. So if you can scroll through your Brady Bunch windows, Risa, if you can wave a little bit, see Risa in the corner of her screen there. So she is going to be our new Community Gauge Learning Coordinator, and she was fortunate enough to be able to be on the call today to be part of this. 
um, but we'll start in two weeks. So she will be a huge resource for all of you as you're getting ready on your courses. And I just wanted you all also to know that we still have all of the connections with the um, Franklin Falls partners. So if you're interested in taking just a bite of community engaged learning this semester, we have that opportunity. So we have the Franklin Falls program. We also have a new program called the Health Equity and Rural Empowerment Initiative, which is gonna pair the learning outcomes and classes with project partners throughout the region. And it's an academic consortium with Dartmouth and perhaps some other institutions as well. So it's sort of the health and well-being version of the Franklin Falls program, but there will be opportunities for all majors to be involved in that project. And then of course we have the Lib Ed program and then we're expanding our partners throughout the region. So we're gonna have a great, this is for you, Peter, inventory of project partners for you to all work with. So if you have ideas you wanna plan for this semester, just something small or start thinking about next semester or next year, get in touch with myself and then you can meet with Risa and I when she comes on board and we can do some brainstorming and dreaming about that. So we'll look forward to getting some more feedback from you about what else would be helpful as you do this work. So please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. And somebody asked where's Risa's office. She'll be working remotely for like some of us are, but working remotely, but it will be in the environmental study suite in Ivy where uh, Leon and Nick and Harvey are. Okay, thank you, Darby. Of course. Great. Of course. Welcome, oh, welcome, uh, welcome, Riza. Yes, Darby, I, I did have one more. I was going to ask Jean Eckridge to unmute and introduce a new faculty member that's with us today. Hi, I got to work with the new faculty last week, and I know uh, one is still finishing up commitments, uh, but I know that Ben Rigi is here. So again, the Brady uh, Bunch uh, scroll, feel free to do that. Ben is coming to us from Dallas. He spent five days camping to get here uh, so that he could avoid hotels. He loves camping. And so, but um, he and his family camped on the way here to avoid hotels and all that uh, wonderful stuff that we're worried about nowadays. So welcome to Ben and um, you'll get to meet him, I'm sure um, soon in person, maybe, or through another Zoom meeting. Terrific. And I think Katie, I think Katie is working today. If Katie's here, she can yell out. I'm happy to. Um, we have another new faculty, Kathleen Noons, and she is, uh, I think, at Dartmouth today. And if you see her name, Kathleen, she goes by Katie, KD, not K A T I E. So, Katie. So, thanks. KD, like Katie Lang? Yes. Aha. Ah, nice. Um, good. Oh, sorry, I'm a huge Katie Lang fan. <laughs> <laughs> So um, what we're going to do now is actually move into our individual workshop time. We have a shorter time period today than we did yesterday, just overall for our time together. So I want to make sure we have time after you've done some work um, individually to um, talk and see where you are at that point. Um, so I'm going to do a couple things right now. I am um, putting into the chat. Um, a copy of all the slides or a link to where you can get to the slides. Um, and um, take a look at those if you wish. And then what I want you to do in this next 30, 40 minutes is again, please just use this as the work time that you've set aside and the institution has set aside for you to focus on CEL. And like yesterday, um, your goal is to get, let something spark, add some oxygen to an idea you have. Um, it could be a, a new course that you wanna propose. It could be a course that you already teach that you think, you know, I could do a new assignment or a do mo new module. I wonder what, who my partner might be. I wonder, you know, but just, just start to get moving on thinking about how you might embrace community engaged learning or embrace it more deeply or in ways that are more exciting to you or you think might be more effective with your students. And again, if you could start with the big picture, why CEL for you? And if the answer is only, because Peter White told me so, you gotta dig deeper, you gotta find something that resonates with you about this pedagogy. And if you can't do that, um maybe let's have a conversation and um, maybe you can chat me and we can just pick up the phone and talk and um and see but i'm assuming that since you're here you bought in enough to be here and so 
really try to try to put some actual language about around your why your why it's not peter's why it's not the grants why your why why ceo maybe because you love students and you know there's a lot of evidence that this is good for their learning right there could be other reasons but figure out what your why is for um what, what your rationale is for in, um, embracing CEL and then start moving towards specifics. And you might think about that continuum model that I shared. Um, I'm not sure that that will be your approach here, but you might think in terms of how much space, how much space. Oh, look at Peter, that should be reason enough. <laughs> um, but how much space in a, in, in a class? Like, can you think about a class? Can you, what class? How much space in that class? Can you imagine it as a single assignment? Have you seen examples uh, that I've offered or that you know that your colleagues have, have tried that you think you might wanna approximate or move in that direction? Can you, you know, is there already an overall project that you know about that's happening and you think, oh, I wonder if I could step in there and take this slice of the work or shed this or illuminate the work in this way with my students. Um, so start to move toward specifics. Um, and I'm gonna put this all, I'll put some prompts in the chat, but what we're gonna do now is turn off our videos and our audios and just go radio silent and work on this until we'll all come back together again at three o'clock, okay? See you at three, all right. So um, it's three o'clock, so let's get going. We have a half an hour left together. What I'd like to do is um, use the Padlet like we did yesterday to um, get everybody to just um, share out um, something um, that you're thinking about or an idea or a next step that you plan to pursue. In particular, I'm trying to get everybody to be forward thinking right now. So what could you commit yourself to do as a next step toward exploring or embracing community engaged learning yourself? So I'm hoping you can go into that Padlet and that the link is working. And it's working for me. I'll see soon enough if it's working for you. Um, so you just go in there and you double click and you just get going. Um, Anybody? Let's see. And remember, it's anonymous. Uh, Darby, it's not showing up. Ah! Okay. Um, let me hang on one second. Oh, it's showing up for me. It's now showing up for me, too. Yep. Shows, shows Com up it's showing up for me. Okay. So, um, it seems to be working. Go ahead and get working in it. If yesterday, I think we had one person for whom it never did work. And if you wind up being like that, apologies <laughs> and hold on. We won't spend that much time in the Padlet. Um, but take your time and um, see what you can get down there this is this is in some ways a little bit harder than vocation in some ways a little bit more challenging than thinking for, for many of us than thinking about um, vocation work
These are great. Keep them coming. I was just about to heart something and then it went away. <laughs> Things move. So if you've already shared yours, go through and look what other people are doing and maybe show some love to ones that resonate with you or that you want to kind of upvote, so to speak. Take about one more minute here. Great. So thank you all for um, working on this and getting getting some things out there. Um, I want to just lift up uh, a few things that, that I'm seeing. Um, I do think connecting the vocation and CEL pieces together is a really important work. And I think this is work that um, you know, needs to be happening at the institutional level, so to speak. So with some of your folks who might be in leadership positions, who could take a draft at something like that and then um, circulate it and, you know, kind of uh, work it. But I do think that's, it's important to, to make sure that, that you have ways of thinking about the relationship between vocation and CEL and some shared language around that. Um, I see a lot of people resonate with the idea of providing science lessons, science lessons via Zoom. Um, I will agree with you that teachers are working so hard and just K-12 teachers. I mean, we all are, but our K-12 teachers as well right now. Um, one of the things that we're doing at Bates, just FYI, is that we are in this space, um, is that we're having um, our students um, create short videos so that many teachers can use them, right? So if you zoom in, that's a one and done and it's great. And one thing you could do is if it goes well, you learn a lot from that experience, then you say, let's make a video of this and uh, make that available. We've actually developed a brand new tool at Bates um, that we call Bates Connect. That's a platform that um, connects and you can actually Google uh, Bates College, Bates Connect, all one word, Bates Connect, and, and see where we are with that. But it's a place where our students through their courses can submit projects 
and those get um, reviewed for possible inclusion on this platform and then K-12 teachers come in and review things and they're filterable through age group or um, grade level and, and subject matter and that kind of thing and they can see what what Bates has to offer that they might want to use in their class. We had been working on this actually to do more in-person delivery like students who develop a presentation and might be willing to um, present it to other classes or something like that but then COVID came so we quickly transitioned it to um, use digital artifacts um, but I, I do think thinking about in, during COVID and thinking about what our teachers need is really important and um, you know if you wind up with a, a teaching resource that somebody develops that is good get it in a way that could be replicated for other teachers in other classrooms um, uh, several people interested in finding good partners, interested in working together. I just want to say that this is one of the most important things that you can be focused on. And I do know that um, some of these grant funds um, have been um, earmarked so that faculty who propose a course and get that sort of course approved um, they can then have some uh, modest funding that will to, to spend time and effort working on partnership development. You also have people like Risa and Jen, whose job it is in a way at Colby Sawyer to be trying to know who's out there and what's happening. Um, faculty support, what might be needed. Faculty who've done CEL, I really encourage you to start a CEL learning community, just put it out there. Everybody who wants to come together once a month, even if it's just over Zoom, to talk about um, how it's going or what's worked well in the past, really just robustly sharing what you've got. Because you've got a lot of stuff here. Uh, I One of the things I hearted was thinking small. Again, start small, get it right. Um, and then several people trying to balance the community engagement and the identification of projects and needs with the time constraints of just teaching a course and, and uh, being able to, to balance it all. And again, um, this is a reason to start small and it's a reason to reach out uh, to share with each other and to support one another. And it's a reason to reach out to Jen and Risa. So I'm gonna um, uh, leave the Padlet. There are other good things here, but I wanna make sure and not um, shortchange our time. Um, so, uh, oh, here's somebody, I'm not gonna be able to respond to this from Courtney, but it looks like a good um, question. Oh, I see, so we can, yeah, but I don't know who posted them, right? Yeah, so you can't really follow up, right? So I would just say, I, I hope someone, whether it's Peter or Jen, will be following up, and I'm, I'm assuming they will, from many of the great ideas that have surfaced here, and that they might be thinking about things like, um, you know, being able to post things. These were some of the great ideas. If one of these was yours and you're willing to be in conversation with somebody else, let's make that happen. And it looks, yep, like Jen is thinking like I'm thinking. So that's great. Um, so let's use the, the raise hand function. You'll recall that if you go to the participant list, go to, into participant, you should be able to raise your hand. Um, click on that raise hand function. If you have a comment, a question, a protestation, an idea, um, I welcome that. Uh, let's just talk to each other for, for a few minutes. Um, you may have a question about, you know, how things work at Bates around faculty development, or, I mean, what, you know, I, I don't know a lot of institutions, but I do know some. I know how things are happening in a few places, and really be glad to um, share what I can with you in my last 17, 20, 17 minutes with you, yeah. So come on y'all, challenge me, bring me something. Nick, thank you. Come to the front, Nick. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, you know, we were talking a little bit during the break uh, in the environmental s studies, just, you know, we really try to do some of these things already. Uh, and one of the challenges uh, I think that uh, we are trying to balance is quite a heavy teaching load with the heavy lift of uh, the front end and then continuing that engagement with the partners to make it a meaningful and uh, uh, 
a meaningful experience for our students, but also trying to uh, get the content in the course done as well. And it, it ends up, I think the reality is it ends up being more time for the faculty member um, to do this. And not that, I, mean, I won't say we shy away from it. I, I would just say sometimes it, you know, sometimes depending on what courses you're teaching, you, you have that space a little more than other times. And so- You do. You do. Um, and I don't think, Nick, I don't think CEL belongs in every course. I don't right, think it's sure. reasonable to expect it to be in every course. What I say to my faculty is I say, I want you to find one course that you consistently teach in, into which you will infuse CEL at one threshold or another. And, and, and some of you will do it in every course you teach, and I have colleagues like that. Um, but it's not reasonable to spec, expect that everybody can do that. But if every single faculty member at Colby Sawyer College had one course, my gosh, this culture would change. Yeah. And your students would be better for it and your community would be better for it. So I think you're right that it does take extra time. This goes back to a comment I made and I know nothing about and I do not wanna open this can of worms right now because we don't have time for it. I know nothing about faculty incentives and rewards at Colby Sawyer College, but this is precisely why this work has to be valued as teaching, as risk-taking, evidence-based teaching. Yep. And, um, and if that's, you know, you need to, you need to rewrite your tenure and promotion or whatever it is you do here, if that's, if that's not reflected there, because it needs to be, because this stuff takes time, it okay. takes courage, um, it takes detail orientation, it takes soft skills like crazy, it, you know, this, this is, this is complex teaching, it is not for the faint of heart. The, the other piece I would just add to that is just, you know, our experience is collaborative efforts really go a long way to deepen this experience, not just for the students, but for the client and the faculty. And so, you know, it just, it's ripe for collaborative efforts. And I saw that in the comments too, just about, you know, looking for partners. And it just, you know, our experience is that that part has been really rewarding on both sides. That's fantastic. And you have this, you know, you have a couple of really deep projects that are already happening and partners um, there. And you may decide, some institutions decide, you know, let's, let's really just everybody focus in such and such a direction. Some institutions say for two years, let's everybody, let's focus on housing or let's focus on food security or whatever. There are different ways of organizing this and you gotta do what, you gotta follow your energy at Colby Sawyer College. I, I don't know what that energy is. Um, but I, I recommend that as, as well. Um, Kathleen. So I guess I'm kind of naming something that we know is an issue and I want to name it because I'm hoping <clears throat> that somebody can raise a lot of money, <clears throat> Dan, um, to try to solve the issue. And the issue is transportation. And what happens is, so I've done CEL projects where I've not made students leave campus and our partners come to us and that can be really beneficial. I've done CEL where students pick their site and I find local locations where students can walk. Those students are never as happy as the ones who can drive to the site that they choose to go to. And when we know that the students who don't have access to cars are the students who are more economically disadvantaged, often international students or, or from urban areas, it really feels like we're doing a disservice to some of our students. And this is an issue that we have with internships already. So I just kind of wanted to name it. Um, Again, there's ways around it. I've, I've figured out ways around it, but I still think we disadvantage some of our, our, our most disadvantaged students um, through this work. And I, I'm hoping that we can work as a community to resolve that at some point. Thank you so much for naming that. It is absolutely an equity issue and it's gotta be, um, it's gotta be front and center in conversation. I will say that um, even before we as the higher education community and in places like Bates and Colby Sawyer were really front loading equity and trying to hold ourselves to new standards. This was always an issue of not around, it wasn't framed as an equity issue, but as just a logistics and how does this work in a resource issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's also, it's also a risk. It's an institutional risk issue, right? It's a liability issue. It's a huge issue. Like if we have our students driving other students to go to, Placements, that's a bad idea. And if we're driving them, it's a worse idea. So, um, you know, I think it is something that needs to be, needs to be thought about. Um, there are two different models, you know, that, that I know about other than public transportation and walking, that kind of thing. 
um, depending on where you're going. So um, at Bates, we actually had a whole bunch of um, bikes that wound up not, you know, anyway, we, 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 we turned, we created like a, a you know, a bike fleet that students, if you were doing weekly, at least on a weekly basis, community engagement, you got a bike for the semester or the year. Um, and again, it's not that great in the winter, but it was depending on where your site was, it was, it was something. Um, some institutions, um, depending again where you're located, it wouldn't work here in Lewiston because we have like one Uber. But um, anyway, some institutions are allowing students, again, it's got to be for a sustained commitment, you know, within a class or, a, you know, you have to have, kind of say, I'm planning to do this every week, blah, blah, blah. Um, they've allowed students to write small transportation grants. We have that program in our center, so you can get up to $150 a semester to go toward transportation. And you can use a cab or an Uber or something like that. And also public transportation if that's, if that's um, available where you are. I will say at Bates, and this is gonna sound so cushy, you guys, but let, you know, I worked for 16 years at a place where I did not have one penny of a budget and it was not my job to do any of this and I did it all. So I've been at both ends of the spectrum. But we have, uh, we've, we have um, two vans and the institution paid for the vans and they pay for the gas and paying the personnel comes out of my budget, paying the drivers comes out of my budget. But they upkeep the vans, they replace them when the time comes. And we have one van that goes all day from 7.45 in the morning till six o'clock at night. Uh, well, actually one of them is on the school route. It's just schools. And then in the afternoon, it adds all these after school programs. So the focus is youth and it's on a set schedule. And the other van we call our taxi van. And that's um, where students can, they have to go to the security office or call when they're like maybe a hundred feet away there. It can't be, you know, on the other side of campus and they can say, I need to go to the senior citizen place or whatever. And they can just do that on a, a kind of um, per need basis. Um, but that has that, when I got here, I was like, Oh my gosh, you have vans to transport your students? <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, that's what you want to head. That's, that's the world you want to live in. Yeah. What else? Hands. And you guys can have these conversations. I hope you'll continue to have them and, and uh, with, with Jen and Risa and Peter and others. Um, uh, you've got me for nine more minutes. So what do you want to know from me or what? insight or thoughts or anything while you've got me. Nothing, apparently. Um, <laughs> no, no worries. It's all right. Um, yep, Jen. So I just wanted to speak to the transportation issue just to say two things about that is we I do hope that we'll find out what some of those barriers are for doing this type of work like transportation and be able to use the money that we have for the grant or budget in the future for these types of things. When we had the Franklin project, we did have a student who had coordinated with all the students that were working on Franklin projects and we had a van going down there once a week so they could meet with project partners. So we can definitely do something like that. It's easier if we're all working in the same community and if we start working all over the place, that'll be more challenging. But I think the other thing that we've learned from COVID is that a lot of the time that we spent getting students down there to get them on site, we can do some of that with Zoom and be really creative and then use the transportation in a more deliberate way to actually get the students to the site, which I don't think we can replace that experience with seeing the context of where it is that they're working, but hopefully we'll have some ideas. And um, I had an idea to do some kind of survey for all of you to find out just a lot of the questions that Darby's asking about what are your needs, what are your concerns, so that we can start to think about how do we address those moving forward. So we'll have lots of opportunities to figure out the CEL, would you call it a learning community where we do, we meet and those kinds of things. So I'll be open to hearing what people will want to see moving forward. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the questions you guys do need to talk about is you know, do we want a sort of we can be anywhere model or do we want to say let's let's focus on a few issues or a few locations, you know, what what's going to make sense. Let's let's primarily limit but have the opportunity for faculty who, you know, who are willing to kind of um, forge their own way to, to do that. Um, one of the things that we do every year that's enormously helpful is we do an RFP for our community partners. 
right? We just send out, we say, we it's kind of like a request for proposals, like you would do for a grant, right? So we just send it out. It's just a basic Google form. It says, you know, we'd love to know how you would love to work with Bates College in the coming year. We send it out, you know, in late spring, early summer, um, and we give them a lot of different, you know, options as well as other. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, so that can be things like, I would love to have a one time, I would love to have one time help with my, um, you know, heart association walkathon. I would love to have a bunch of students on such and such a date help to do X. And then I really need some help thinking about how to turn the corner on teen pregnancy at the high school. And this is gonna be a long and deep project and I need, you know, right? So we get a sense of what's out there. We have to manage expectations and say, we have no idea if we'll be able, you know, we'll definitely get back to you, <laughs> but we may tell you, ah, we've got no one for you, but, but thank you because someday we hope to have somebody for you, that kind of thing. But that's, that's, um, that's you know, information that can be really useful. And then to have the same thing from faculty, you know, like, what are you interested in? The kind of things that Jen's talking about, a kind of inventory of needs and interests, obstacles, opportunities, those kind of things. What else? I'll be patient. I tell my students, I'm so patient. Watch how patient I can be. Who's got an idea or a thought, a question? How about any, any kind of pushback against the way things have been going or against things that I've said? I'm always looking for that. I have a, I have a question. This is Tom. Thank you. Hi. Um, did you, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to raise my hand. Okay, jump on <laughs> in. Um, have you ever had any problems with organizations kind of abusing this relationship? Um, for example, a business or a, a community organization, um, you know, inviting students in, but then it kind of goes sideways. How do you, have you had to deal with that at all? Sure. Um, I will say that we only partner with nonprofit and municipal or governmental organizations. So that's somewhat limits, but um, yeah, I mean, we've never had, I wouldn't call it, um, we've never had any um, harassment or, or abuse of individual students. I would say we've had plenty of um, folks who um, overpromise themselves. Like they, they're like, oh, we'd love this. It'd be so great if we had Bates students do X and I'll oversee it and all blah, blah, blah. And then like real life sets in and they cannot follow through on what they thought they could follow through on. So there are these, and th those are the situations where the faculty member is reaching out to me and saying, oh my gosh, you know, this is completely falling apart. What can I do? And one of the things that happens is like, I march into that class and we have a reflection conversation about failure and about what we can learn and you know, that kind of thing. But also um, I work really hard, my staff and I do, to try to, to try to develop a plan B. And you know, sometimes a plan B is um, where we say to students, okay, you know, this, this in-person, the hands-on stuff is not gonna work, it's, it's blown up. Um, we want to salvage this, and so you're going to take what you've learned, and you're working small groups, and you're going to write a series of um, short, um, kind of op-ed-ish articles for the newspaper. Or you're going to, you know, you're going to write about, you know, you're going to learn something. Maybe you can do a little interviewing of some people or whatever. But generally, it's just take what you learn, but think about a public writing and a public audience, and so that you're still engaging with and making some kind of contribution to the wider world. Um, that's just an example of a way that we've, we've that's, we are, we're always thinking, how could we possibly save this for the students, for their learning, and for this commitment to trying to be engaged in beneficial ways with the off-campus community. But yep, things, things sometimes go sideways, but I'll just say rarely. So at Bates, we usually have, I don't know, about 30 classes at any given time that we're supporting in any semester that are community engaged learning. And usually one of them has real problems. Something happens. And so we're really, really trying to troubleshoot and rescue a class. But out of 30, that's not that bad. And um, again, our main focus at that point is, you know, uh, how uh, is student learning? And as long as student learning can, can still happen, 
we're okay unless it's the students who've made the project go sideways and then our big worry is how can we make sure that the partner is you know usually most of our partners are people who partnered with us before and will partner with us again so they get it they're co-educators and if you're an educator you know that 18 to 22 year olds do not always deliver and so our partners know that our first time partners we're trying to make sure we succeed <laughs> <laughs> like, like, no matter what, it's got to be a good experience for them. But the ones who've been working us, with us for 30 years, you know, I pick up the phone, I say, Carla at Lewiston Housing Authority, I'm so sorry, this group has gone AWOL, you're not going to get this work, I'm really sorry. And she's like, Darby, no big deal, catch you next time. So that's, that's what we're hoping for. Okay, we are out of time or at time. Um, I just wanna say thank you so much. I love Colby Sawyer College. It's been so great to spend now like three days with you. Um, so thanks for having me. And um, if there are things that I, you know, that I can share with you, things I've mentioned that you wonder if I have a resource for or a page to share from Bates or whatever, like I'm an open book, happy to share anything with you. Um, and, um, yeah, just thanks to Jen and Jean and Peter and, and everybody else here. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So, thank you so Peter, much. Last from you, Peter? I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time the last couple of days and get us, uh, closer to our, our goal down the line of CEL and vocation. And we're excited to, to move forward and we'll pick it up. So it every goes. single person today, Peter, here's the thing. And yeah. I would be a hard ass about this if I were you. Um, every single person here was asked to have a next step to take around CEO within the next semester. Okay, this is a time frame that is reasonable. One thing, and if I were you guys, I would I would check back in on people, and I'd say, you know, I don't we don't know what your one thing was, yeah. but please remember that you did choose one, and why don't you write it on a little piece of paper and put it somewhere where you'll look at it occasionally because you know I want to challenge you to hold to that one next action step some of you are going to get tons done but just just that one thing is a step in the right direction and in my experience if you can actually do one thing out of a conference it's that's great, Wonderful. <laughs> great advice. and I never look back so all right thank you everybody great advice. Thank, thank you, you. okay bye-bye